Good morning. Welcome to Lutheran Memorial Church and School. Remember the Church of Lutheran Confession, the CLC. Today we begin Holy Week, Palm Sunday, and we hail Christ, our Prince of Peace. Let's begin this morning's worship service with prayer to that Prince of Peace. O Lord God, we come together to hear your word, that through the hearing of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in your grace and holiness. Hear us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We follow the order of service as printed in your bulletin or on the projection screen in front of you. We begin our Savior's worship service this Palm Sunday in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We open with the singing of hymn 160, verses 1, 4, and 5. those of you who had the opportunity over this Lenten season during the midweek services to enjoy the Passion History reading, we had the opportunity during this Holy Week to enjoy the Passion History account as well as we have a harmonized uh, lessons of the four Gospels here for today, for Thursday, for Friday, for Sunday. And so seeing over probably 30 chapters of God's Word through the four Gospel accounts here for our enjoyment and understanding and knowledge of what our Savior went through for us. The first portion that we focus on today, from Saturday going into Palm Sunday, we see from Bethany to Jerusalem. Now we know that Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head, but Bethany was a town about less than 10 miles from Jerusalem that Jesus stayed at uh, with his friend Lazarus and Mary and Martha. So what we see today and throughout the early part of Holy Week is Jesus returning to Bethany in the evening so to speak, to rest there and go back to Jerusalem to continue to share the good news of why he had come. The first lesson he focuses on, the murders of murder, uh, which is the day before Palm Sunday. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, 
many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. As they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. We continue with hymn 162, verses 1 through 3. The next day, as he approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a donkey tied there with her colt, which no one has ever ridden. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied in the doorway, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the colt, its owners, standing there, asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to. The Lord needs it. And the people let them go. They brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! The crowds that went ahead and those who followed began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We sing hymn 70 verses 1 and 2 and join in those hosannas.
As we just sang, we assemble in God's house today to hear the love and the forgiveness of our Savior. We make confession of our sins using the words found in your bulletin. Please rise to make confession of our faith. Dear fellow redeemed of our Lord Jesus Christ, on that first Palm Sunday, our Savior came in triumph to Jerusalem with people shouting their hosannas and little children singing his praise. But Jesus did not come to reign over an earthly kingdom. He came in peace as the Prince of Peace to lay down his life on Calvary's cross for the sins of the whole world. O Lamb of God, who came to suffer and die for us, send God the Spirit to rule in our hearts with your divine grace and lead us back to view your cross and crown of thorns. Fill us with a deep sorrow for the full cup of God's wrath you drank to pardon us from all of our sins of thought, word, and deed. Accept our humble thanks and praise for the kingdom of heaven that you have won for us, knowing the terrible judgment that would come upon us had you not endured the suffering and shame for our glory. Cleanse us from all sin and doubt, O God. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is our Lord and King, and God's anointed payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven in Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's continue standing and sing the second two verses of hymn 7. third lesson, uh, probably Sunday afternoon or closer towards evening, we see Jesus' sorrow over Jerusalem. Now the crowd had continued to spread the word that Jesus had called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple, the whole city asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They looked around, he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We have the opportunity this morning to confess 
who this Jesus is. More than just a prophet, the Son of God, who lived and died for our sins. Let's rise boldly to make that confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the singing of hymn 725 of the supplement. Please be seated. Some of you might be wondering, 
Why no children's sermon on Palm Sunday? Of any Sunday, it would seem like the most fitting Sunday to have a children's sermon. As we look at the text that we read earlier, we see that it was the children who were crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. We see throughout the week it was the children in the temple who were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remembering today that all of us are children by faith. Children of our Father in heaven. And sitting here today learning the word of our Savior God. And so, dear pilgrim partners, may the word of God be with you this morning. Because we know that every word of God is pure. And all scripture is given by the inspiration of God for our learning, for our knowledge. I have a shirt that I've had for quite some time now. It has two words on it. Echo Christ. What does that mean, to echo Christ? If you think about that phrase, actually if you look really closely at the fine print there, it says from Ephesians 5, Be imitators of God as, our, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. Be imitators. God is not asking. It's a command. Be imitators. Echo Christ and his love. Is that command in your life? Just fine print? Hardly visible for anyone to see? All of us want to say, no! It stands out that I echo Christ. Does our attitude in life echo our saviors? As we look at our text today, the verses from 5 to 11 in Philippians are often thought of as a very poetic section. Some even believe that it was one of the early hymns of the Christian church. Our text for today from Philippians 2, the first half of that wonderful section showing the humility and exaltation of Christ shows us the attitude of our Savior. An attitude that we're focusing on today that the Lord tells us to imitate. That he demands of us to echo with our lives. We read from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is the word of God, and so we pray. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your triumphant entry today, enter also triumphantly into our hearts so that we gladly hear, learn, and are comforted by your holy word. Amen. Our meditation today is simple enough. Pray for Christ's attitude in you. We'll be looking at that in two brief points. Because we first of all want to behold Christ's attitude. And secondly, because we need to ask the question, how can we pray for this attitude in our lives? That word behold, I I really like to cling to because it's such a rich word. We all beheld today in those three lessons part of the path and part of the journey the Lord has done for us, for you specifically. We behold, we look, we pay special attention to this journey of Christ because it demonstrates for us God's love for us. Individually. A love that no one can take away from you. A love that is worthy to behold again today. We pay special attention to Christ's attitude. If you look back in your bulletin to the first lesson, Go ahead, take a look there. The last paragraph of the first lesson, what does it say there? Jesus went on his way to Jerusalem. The last paragraph of that first lesson reminds us that he knew what was going, he was going to be facing. He knew that people were plotting to put him to death in Jerusalem. 
But he went there anyway, knowingly, willingly, to save those who would put him to death. Know the attitude in the mind of Christ. He did not come to be served, but came to serve others with his very life, even the ones who put him to death. As we learned this past week from our Lenten service, that we are included in putting our Savior to death because we are included in sinning against God. How about that second lesson? We see over and over again those hosannas that were sung and said of Jesus. Do you know what the word hosanna means? It means save now, we pray, O Lord. Hosanna. Save us. As we recognize how that crowd so quickly turned from triumph praises to yelling crucify Jesus, they were looking for the wrong kind of king. The attitude of our king who came to serve was the one who was willingly looking to save them from their sin. Not from Roman oppression. How about that third lesson? Second to last paragraph there. Jesus prays for Jerusalem as he approached, as he was looking on, knowing the coming destruction and weeping for them. Jesus went knowing the destruction of the world, knowing that his path was for the purpose of saving and redeeming the world. We see the mind of Christ. Because he could see the rejection of his coming, also saw the judgment of God's wrath for those who would disobey him and reject him as Christ and Savior. So we look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you. The mind of Christ. In the Greek there, that word phroneo, this, this mind, this mind of care, this mind concerned for the things of Christ's kingdom. That's what Christ was concerned about as he went on to death. He's concerned about our eternal welfare. He's concerned about each one of you because it's, he went to die for you and for your sins. Each lesson demonstrates God's love. It's a commitment type of love. The type of love that we see in Titus 2, verse 1, when it talks about love of parents for their children. You don't give up on your children. You love them even when they disobey you. The same type of love we see from our Father in Heaven, only perfect. A commitment love saying that I will even die for you. I will even die for my enemies. I'm going to demonstrate how much I love you in my death, our Lord said to us. That perfectly, perfect fatherly love, as we see in the verse 6 there, it says about Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? Jesus the Christ, who being in the form of a man, also it says here was in the form of God, but didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. Was Jesus trying to rob God of something? No, of course not. If we believe, as the Scriptures teach, that Jesus is true God, God cannot rob himself of something that is already his. If Jesus is God already, as we believe, then he can't rob himself of being God. And so we see he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God because that's what he was. True man and true God for our glory. Often when we explain it to people, we, we simply have to tell them, Jesus as man did not make full use of his divine power. Now what does that look like? Well, if you ever come over to the house or maybe in the summer in our front yard, I'll be wrestling with Titus. Do I have power to defeat him? Absolutely. But I don't make full use of that power. Think of that illustration with our Savior. He coming to this world was fully God. He had all power to vanquish his enemies. He didn't need the angels. He didn't need anyone else. He didn't need Peter drawing his sword in the garden. But he did not make full use of his power because he was on a path for our salvation. That's why we're here today. To hear of that love of God's plan for us. Of how he wrestled in life with sin and death. So that we wouldn't have to. 
we see a godly love that we can only hope and pray to echo. A godly love in our Savior that is selfless in everything that he did and his forgiveness for us. The kind of love we need in marriages. Ephesians 4 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. A demonstration of love, if you will, of sacrifice, of putting the other person first rather than ourselves. That goes beyond marriage. That goes beyond dating or relation, any, every relationship. When it comes to parenting, I mentioned that Titus 2 passage. Paul reminded the young pastor Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Let the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, love their very specific, a commitment kind of love. I ask you this morning, does the world know this kind of love? Look at its track record in marriage, in parenting, in, in treatment of other people. We are here to echo Christ and His love for us. And the world has lost it. Know the love of your Savior. That's what we're doing here this week. How important is this for us to drink pure water? Would we get upset with the city of Fond du Lac if a little bit of sewage got into our drinking water? How important it is for us to have the pure gospel of Christ, the pure word of God, and here it is in our text. Verses 7 and 8. Look at it with me. But Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. God's pureness, God's perfection was what we needed because you and I are dreadfully sinful. Because you and I have disobeyed God's law. And so today again, we are privileged to hear the gospel of Christ. Today we're able to hear the attitude of our Savior who is willing to do everything for our benefit. How can we pray for this attitude? That's what we're closing with this morning. How can we focus on this attitude of Christ? How can that be mine? How can that mind be in me as well? Our Lenten Passion Series was a good opportunity to, to hear that. As we examine the passionate prayers of our Savior, we see, and we get a first-hand look into, with the Word of God, the mind of Christ. As He prayed in the garden, as He prayed for His enemies, as He prayed for the journey of head that we're looking at this week, over and over again, we see the passionate love of our Savior. We have the opportunity, the blessed privilege, to hear the love of God, to read and to know that we aren't alone in this world, that God loves you, that He cares about you, that He wants a better relationship with you. One of the things I worry about in life is, as my children get old, older, what kind of relationship am I going to have with them? Are they going to be able to come to me with all their problems? Are they going to feel comfortable to talk to me with their concerns? How is that relationship going to grow? We know that all of our relationships prosper when time is spent together. When time is spent learning of each other's loves whatever the relationship might be. Today, we are spending time with our Savior to grow in our relationship with Him. But truly know His love so that we are confident whether a loved one dies, or whether we face challenges that we don't feel like we can overcome, or we're overly depressed about what this life has to offer, we know God's love. 
Because he laid down his life for us. Because he made himself of no reputation. He made himself nothing in this world to give us victory. I sent out this morning over email, for those of you who have given me their email addresses, a discussion of March Madness. When you think about that, we are in the season of madness right now during church. We focus on the madness of what our Savior had to do for us to win our victory, to give us a hope of eternal life. And that is so wonderful to be able to focus on, to follow our victor throughout the season and to know the price that he paid for us. The back of the bulletin, if you look there briefly, you see how we continue to see that passionate love of our Savior. The different aspects we focused on, that mind of Christ throughout the season of Lent, but into this week as well. As we see him praying at the communion table with his disciples, those who followed him in his word, as he prayed to finish his work, to complete it out on Good Friday, to be able to say it is done so that we can know that we are saved today. And to continue to spread that joy this coming Easter Sunday. The day he rose from the dead. So that we can share with all those who fear death the hope that we have. The life that we look forward to for eternity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Praying for the mind of Christ is simple. When you know the mind of Christ from the word of God. That is our opportunity again this week. That is our opportunity every time we come to church is to read the word, to know the mind of our Savior, to have that same attitude of a selfless serving of others, even our enemies. What a wonderful thing that we remember as we bridge today into this season of Holy Week, as we see that path and that road of our Savior to Calvary's cross for us, we see his love. We behold his glory given freely to us. What a wonderful thing as we focus on our own prayers, as we ask the question, how can we pray for this attitude of Christ? We know it's not just by praying. We can't just say, well, I pray, so I must have the attitude of Christ. It'd be like me saying, I weld. I don't. If I did, I wouldn't weld well. We learn to pray. We learn to pray from our Savior. We get strength from Him. And in hearing and reading God's Word, He teaches us what to pray for. We are blessed to read and hear the harmonies of God's passion. We read them again. I encourage you, read them again at home in your bulletin. How to pray from the mind of Christ. We do so to the Holy Spirit to give us the strength to make it more than just fine print in our life. But to echo the one who lived and died for our salvation. Amen. Please rise. May this peace of God which passes all understanding guard and keep your greatest treasure through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with the, offer, uh, the offering of thankful hearts and we'll be singing the sermon hymn uh, 763 from the Tan Supplement. Please be seated. Mm-hmm.
special prayer request today uh, reminds us that Palm Sunday, historically speaking from Luther Memorial, has been in the past Confirmation Sunday, where many of our members had made solemn promises to the Lord to be faithful to Him. And so today we keep in our prayers those who made those vows and pray that the Lord would move our hearts to encourage others to hear God's Word so that they too could continue to want to follow Him in their life as well. With this prayer and the general prayer for Palm Sunday, we pray. O God, Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving and joy. We magnify your glorious name. The deep places of the earth are in your hand. The strength of the hills is yours also. The sea is yours, and you made it, and your hands formed the dry land. You spoke, and it was done. You send forth your word, and it accomplishes your purpose. In this hour devoted to you, we thank and praise you that you sent to us the living word, your Son, Jesus Christ. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised its shame. Grant that as we look unto him who died in our place, we may, by his example, never tire of well-doing. Give us patience so that we will not complain when we are chastened and corrected, nor despise 
despair of your mercy. Give us the strength to bear up under any cross which you may lay upon us for our good. By your grace, help us to imitate our Savior in humility and obedience, and lead us to follow in his footsteps to eternal glory. Save us, O Lord, not by the works of our righteousness which we have done, but by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Pardon us on account of Jesus' wounds and heal us with his stripes. Set us apart as people who are redeemed from sin and dedicated to a life lived for your glory and for the needs of our fellow human beings. Let your church gather all from far and near into your kingdom of faith. Send forth workers to proclaim your word and truth and to show forth the name of Jesus as the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Give success to the witness of believers in this world, that all may know you, from the least to the greatest. Grant to this congregation here at Luther Memorial, and to all who worship here, strength of purpose in your holy service, that we may seek with willing minds and pure hearts the building and strengthening of your kingdom. We pray for all who are in sickness, pain, anxiety, fear of death, or sorrow. Be with them when they pass through the waters of trouble. Let them trust in you, for you will deliver them. Now unto you, O God, who are able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of your glory, to you be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise for the Lord's Prayer and the Benediction. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the last hymn. We're going to be singing hymn 161 out of the Red Hymn.
Very warm welcome to all of you here today. We're glad you could be here to hear the Word of God and remember what His promises mean to us and see the love and attitude of Christ. I hope you're able to, and I encourage you all to come Thursday evening and Good Friday for the services. Uh, good, uh, Monday, Thursday service is at 7. Good Friday is at 1.30. Uh, this Sunday we will be having our Easter brunch from 8.30 to 9.30. Again, I uh, hope that you're able to make... Uh, make it time to come for that that morning and fellowship a little bit with uh, down there in the basement. Um, just a reminder that if you're going to order lilies for up front for next Sunday, today is the last day you can order that. There's a sign-up sheet in the entryway to Lisa Horton if you're uh, interested in doing that. But today is the deadline for that. No school this week. Just a reminder, uh, these kids are on spring break. Uh, I'll be out of town the first three days of this week, so uh, Tuesday's mission committee meeting we're going to postpone until a future time. Um, and uh, I wanted to, I forgot last Sunday to make mention that the flowers up front here were donated by uh, Arlen Lanehart's family. Um, and the, the palms, I think, especially up front here, were uh, by uh, Bonnie Martin's family, so we thank them for that donation. Also, this Friday, we're going to be doing a couple things to the cross here. Uh, if anyone has a black tablecloth, uh, let me know on the way out, because we were looking at changing the purple to black for Good Friday. So please tell me on the way out. I also want to uh, uh, read here the letter from uh, Jen Ullman, whom we called a couple weeks ago to be our lower grade and kindergarten teacher. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, with much prayerful consideration, I have been led by our Lord to accept the call to serve in your midst, as a kindergarten and lower grade teacher. I share with you the knowledge that bringing up our children in the way of the Lord is an eternally important work, and I look forward to serving you as we train up his children. Please continue to keep peace through Christ in your prayers as they start the task of calling a new teacher for their school. Also, your continued prayers on my behalf and on behalf of my new work among you are greatly appreciated. In our precious Savior's name, Teacher Jen Omen. We can definitely rejoice and thank the Lord that he's answered our prayers and provided us a, a lower grade teacher and kindergarten teacher. And we uh, also continue to thank him for the teachers that we have continued to serve until the end of the year. Uh, so we want to make that uh, acknowledgement as well. We'll probably be having a, a going away party for them um, at the end of the school year. Just a heads up, uh, probably towards the end of May. Um, so just keep that in mind. There is a school committee meeting today following the service. I believe choir will also try to meet briefly to go through the pieces for this week. I don't believe there's any other announcements. Choir practice. Okay. A choir practice. May the Lord continue to be with all of you and bless you as we see his love this holy week.